breathing. It's a dirty game, cops and robbers. There's no doubt about it. There are lots of people who don't want the truth to come out. G'day, Megan, how are you? All good? That's a woman holding a bag full of bad secrets. I firmly believe in my heart of hearts that this is absolutely a wrongful incarceration for murder for Sue or Fraser. Probably the biggest frustration I found as I moved through this case was I kept seeing time and time again clues missed. And if I could find them nine years later, why weren't they found five minutes after the crime? Megan Vass was a key to all of this because her DNA is the anchor in this case. The DNA of Megan Vass was found on the deck of the yacht, Four Winds. But during Sue Neil Fraser's murder trial, Megan told the court that she had never been on the boat. Colin has a new lead that might finally explain this DNA mystery. For me, the most exciting thing that's happened in this inquiry, full stop, has been to meet Gabby. She's an informer, a woman that's been in the underworld for most of her 43 years. She came to us voluntarily as a prison inmate. She's a criminal. Gabby knew Megan Vass well. She also mentioned that Megan was a keeper of diaries and she had seen a diary entry that indicated that Megan was there that night the night of the killing of Bob Chappell. Three months after Colin's first meeting with new informant Gabby, she is released from prison. Gabby had promised to make contact with me once she got out of jail. She texted me just, just to remind who she was from Risen Prison and that she'd been home for a couple of weeks. She's obviously getting her life back into order again. There was lots of promise and lots of desire on her part to want to help sue Neil Fraser and also to set the record straight with what she thought was the, the true story behind the death of Bob Chappell. Well, Gabby was telling me that she was a friend of Megan Vass and therefore she could facilitate an interview She's spoken and renewed contact with Megan. She's had some really heartfelt chats with Megan and Me Megan is willing to assist. Gabby had been an inmate with Sue at Risdon Prison. Sue's made the most of a horrible situation. She's become a mentor and a teacher for other prisoners. She helps them with their literacy. And Gabby was one of those prisoners that she took under her wing and was helping. I believe Gabby realised that Sue is not guilty. There's a real honour amongst thieves and often people who are on the other side of the law, when they see something wrong, they don't like it and they want to do something about it. Out of the blue came a phone call. It was from Gabby and she was in the company with Megan Vass. They'd been up all night. They'd been talking about the four winds and the, and the death of Bob Chappell and what Megan was doing on the yacht. Then all of a sudden, Megan was introduced to me on the phone. Megan told me that she was on the yacht. There was a fight on the yacht. She fucked off, that was her words. And I thought, gee, this is pretty good stuff. I believe she gave me a tease. 
She gave me a bit of information as to what happened on the yacht that night. That's a woman holding a bag full of bad secrets. I've been working on this case for nine years, looking for any information that will tell us the truth about what happened to Bob Chappell. And to think that Colin gets a phone call, speaks to Megan Bass, and she tells him in her own words, she was on the yacht that night. It's unbelievable. It's massive. Megan Vass was definitely there. She was present. She saw it. She then reiterated that she was sick of running and she wants to stop running and do the right thing and recall all the events after years of hiding. There's a set of Megan's diaries and they've got in the hands of Gabby before she was incarcerated and Megan doesn't know where they are, but Gabby does. Those diaries are really important because they become a contemporaneous notes from Megan as to her thoughts and what she did and what she heard and who was with her and so they're invaluable. So are you meeting with Gabby first, like alone? Well, they obviously have to. But Gabby is part of the underworld. She's involved with one of the outlaw motorcycle gangs. She's on a, on a high level in that underworld. There's no doubt about it. She's not kicking around down, down in the, the streets. She's really on that high level. I was getting worried that this whole investigation was getting dangerous. A simple little search for the truth was suddenly turning into getting involved with a bikey gang. But Gabby is our only link to Megan Vass and her diaries. A diary is so important because it could provide written proof of what happened to Bob. So first we need to meet with Gabby and hear everything Megan has told her. Gabby hasn't been able to get the diaries yet, but she's agreed to meet Colin in a Melbourne hotel to make a statement. There's a lot of reasons why you choose hotel rooms in these sorts of situations. Hotel rooms offer some sort of neutral basis to work with, both sides. It's usually safe. This is basically our set. No one sleeps here. You could, you could sleep here with a roll of bed, but you might just get shot at three in the morning. But I, I'm just telling you the worst case scenario. Bundy, if you got one. Tell me where to go. Yep, why not? I'll get out of your way. Close the door. Cameras are on. And I'll tell you when they're not on, and I'll yeah. tell you when they're on. <coughs> Gabby's a 43 year old woman with a checkered past. There's no doubt about it, she's a criminal. I've been involved with a lot of criminal witnesses. It's really incumbent on you to test them, to check them, make sure that what they're saying is correct without them knowing. She said she was staying at a mother's place, for example, and her mother lived at such and such. So we check such and such, and there's a mother, she lives there. That's good. So we know that basic information's not bullshit. Now, yeah, criminal background. How many prior convictions do you have? Who are you driving in traffic infringements? But I do have some Supreme Court ones. Is it fair to say that? Uh, because of your criminal activity and associations, you've got to know the underworld? Pretty much, yep. I wound up um, wrapped up in white clubs. They can become a little bit hardcore, you know, from just like shop thefts and ram raids to home invasions and murder. So Gabby is involved in some serious stuff. This is dangerous territory that we're delving into. But you wait for years just to find out what happened to Bob Chappell on that night. Is this the breakthrough that we've been waiting for? Is this the moment we're gonna find out the truth?
Colin is meeting with a new informant in a Melbourne hotel room. Gabby claims to have information about Bob Chappell's disappearance. That a 15-year-old homeless girl, Megan Vass, was a witness to the crime. It's the biggest breakthrough in the case so far. The important thing is it's the absolute truth. If along the way you don't think something's right in this statement taking process, tell me you're wrong. Just say you're wrong. The important thing about Gabby was that she could lead us to the diaries and she could lead us to Megan Vass. But we needed to get her first to document everything that Megan had told her to the best of her knowledge. So when you're in prison, you got to know an inmate called Sue. Sue Fraser. I got a job in the garden. We got quite close. She took me under a wing and kind of like, taught me everything she knew about the garden. And when I was in there and I was having a really hard time of it and I was suicidal, it was her that brought me back to realising that I don't have to be paying for every mistake I've made for the rest of my life. I'm doing my time, that's not. So she was supportive? Oh, very extremely. She didn't see a junkie, she didn't see a criminal. She just saw me for somebody I hadn't seen before. I've lived around a lot of criminals. I've seen a lot of, a lot of people go missing and Sue isn't capable of that. So you've done the right thing by being, by being honest yeah. about who you are and where, what, you've, what your journey's been. You can see where we're going. This is yeah. to a girl called yeah. Megan. We're up to there now. I want you to do me a favour. Go back into where you were with her mm -hmm. and remember as clear and as accurate as you can her words to you. It's a, coming out of her mouth. Yeah. She was on a beach in Sandy Bay. I was on a beach... In Sandy Bay. In Sandy Bay. We used to hang around there a bit with other homeless kids and we always just hung around drinking, whatever. Who was she going out with? She was hanging with him all the time. You hear his name in criminal circles, he's a and their name's pretty prominent in criminal circles. They're not all like it, obviously, but most. Enough for the family to have gathered that kind of name. Keep going. Put her mouth to you. And were with his mate, who had a boat not far from Four Winds. She said that it was somehow decided that we would go out and check that boat out. There was a dinghy on the beach. We took that. When we got onto the boat, they started mucking around, looking for things to steal. Bob must have heard the commotion came up from the bottom. Megan was just standing there, just frozen. Megan explained to you that she was frozen, standing there. Yeah, just standing there, because they didn't expect anyone to be there. Because the dinghy was ashore, they thought no one was on the boat. One of the boys forced him to go back downstairs. She says, I, I can hear them yelling and fighting. Where was Megan when this was? Upstairs, like on the deck. Did she tell you that? Yeah. She said that she'd go down, she didn't move from when she got on. And she said that she got scared and she didn't want to know what was going on, so she asked to take her ashore. Did she tell you where you then went? I'm back out to the body. The words are, I didn't see anything, so I don't even know nothing. But I knew it was bad the next morning because there were cops and shit everywhere. I literally, I, I felt like I'd stopped breathing. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. What Gabby told me in her statement was pretty well similar to what she, Megan had told me personally herself, that she was on the yacht and there was other people involved. So there was a consistency, and that's really important when you a search for the truth, you want consistency. Have you got any doubt that she was telling the truth when she no. said she was on four wings? She definitely was there, and she definitely knows what happened. The whole scenario, whatever she saw, whatever she knows, consumes her. You know that? Yeah, yeah. Megan 
seems to think that you either go to jail for it or you don't. She doesn't want to go to jail, therefore she can't remember anything. And do you feel she might have wanted to talk? I always think she wants to talk. She did want to talk to you. Something frightened her about talking. Megan Vass, she would know the criminal code of the underworld. You don't give up on anybody, otherwise you're on the dog. And to be on the dog is to be killed. Eventually you'll be killed. Alrighty, trying to read this, sign it. I reckon Megan is shit scared of the truth. I think she's scared of the people that she was with on the night. The fear of what might happen to her if she tells the truth. We're all in danger. The informers, the witnesses. There are lots of people in Tasmania who don't want the truth to come out. I'm scared people are going to come after us. There's some serious and dangerous information here. It started to feel like we were closing in on the truth. The more Colin brings light to this case, the more we get a strong picture of what really happened to Bob Chappell, and it's tragic. It's tragic because a man was murdered, never had a proper funeral, has lost his life, and now his partner is sitting in jail for this crime that she didn't commit. This whole case could be solved if we could just prove that Megan Vass was on that yacht. You would think that the person whose DNA is at a crime scene would be the key witness but Megan Vass was only on the stand a very short time and she basically said, I don't remember anything. Megan Vass's DNA was found on the deck of the Four Winds. A DNA sample can be obtained from bodily fluids, which could be blood, bodily secretions, saliva. The patch was the size of a dinner plate. It was huge. So you wonder, what could it be? Like, it's more than spitting. Could it maybe be vomit? At trial, it somehow became a secondary transfer. The forensic expert suddenly was saying, yes, it's possible it's a secondary transfer, i.e. walked onto the yacht on the boot of a policeman. And that's the moment the jury can think, oh, well, she said she wasn't there, and now the expert's saying it's possibly been walked on by someone else. And so she's excused. It's just ridiculous. There's no way that DNA, the size of a dinner plate, could be transferred onto the yacht by someone else. Like, what size boot do you have to have to bring that DNA there? There's so much in this case that doesn't add up, but Gabby's statement does make sense. It gives us a view of what might have really happened on that night. Gabby described how Megan and her ex-boyfriend had been with an older guy who lived on a small yacht nearby and that they'd gone to the Four Winds to see what they could steal. And they came across Bob Chappell didn't realise he'd be on board. And a fight broke out. According to Gabby, Megan wasn't involved in the murder but was up on the deck, but could hear all the fighting going on and knew it was really bad. If the information we've been told is true, Megan was with two males and one of them that she named lived on a nearby yacht. This all fits together because we know there was a criminal who had a small yacht right next to the Four Winds. This is like all loose ends tying together. 
Gabby is the first insight, the first vision into what happened on that yacht. To formalise Gabby's statement, Eve and Colin organised for it to be turned into a legally binding document called an affidavit, which is witnessed and signed by a lawyer. After we got Gabby's affidavit in Melbourne, and we were feeling pretty pleased, she was going to go back and organise the meeting with Megan and get the diaries. That was what was important. We had to hear this story from Megan herself. When Gabby lands back in Tasmania, she is met by police at the airport, arrested and sent straight back to Risdom Prison. Oh, my God. It turns out she got arrested for some old driving offence, but I just thought, this is weird. It doesn't add up. She's back in prison. What went through my mind was that she was being punished for giving us information. If we discover something untoward happened with that woman being zapped into jail, then we've got something serious happening, unless she was caught dealing or doing something else. Like, is that possible? What's frightening, though, is to have this information, to think there are murderers out there walking around. I am worried. Gabby was our link to Megan. When she got arrested, we lost everything. Access to Megan, the diaries. Megan then seemed to just vanish. She just disappeared. There was so much stress going on trying to get Megan. We had critical information. Colin felt that it wouldn't be long before someone would find out. The pressure was mounting, and I think it was really getting to him. So we've got a clear understanding how Bob was killed. There's enough there to know who the offenders are. So she's, she's in fear of being prosecuted. I had a thought about that, but you don't want to know about it, do you? Or do you? Are you in pain? going. So if we can't get her in, Megan, what's the strategy? We will get her in. There can't be a second strategy. You know, we, we've got to really go for that. Um. <clears throat> I don't feel at all well. I've been getting these chest pains for the last five or six days. And I think I'm going to have to go. Oh, Tim, can you, you drive me to the hospital? Yeah. yeah. Colin is rushed into emergency surgery after suffering a heart attack. The investigation is now on hold. Hence the heart attack. This couldn't have come at a worse time. Susie more strife than me. Colin does not stop. The heart attack did not stop him. He literally walks out of hospital and he's back talking to witnesses and lining things up. 
I was really saying, no, we can't do this, but he just overrules me. Colin really believes that Sue is innocent, and I think he just felt a responsibility to keep going, to doggedly go and find the truth. I was trying desperately to get to Megan Vass. I had Megan's mother's number, so I gave her a call. So she, does she go from shelter to shelter still? Oh, they won't have her. And I was tap dancing, that's trying to build a rapport as quick as I could on a phone call, which lasted only about yeah. 10 or 12 minutes, I guess. Well, let's have a little chat tomorrow, and if you don't feel comfortable, then, you know, we're in a, we're in a coffee shop and you can just walk the other way, but, um, but at least I can put the cards on the table and, and, and it, might, it might come up something, you know? Bye-bye. Megan is the absolute worry of her life. She's still homeless. She still goes from place to place. Uh, although I thought she had an address. Not at all. She, she just goes from one place to another. I asked about the shelters and they, they, she said they simply won't have her anymore. She's burnt every bridge she's ever had. I, I think I came to understand her and her motherly grief and disappointments. She's agreed to meet me tomorrow at 11.30 and she seemed fairly positive about meeting tomorrow at 11.30. And then the next day I arrived, and as I went to the cafe, I got a text message. Hi, Colin. Sorry for last minute notice, but I will not be attending at this cafe today after all. Too much opposition from my police friend. So at that point forward, I knew that she was connected to someone close in the police department, and that worried me. We've lost Gabby, and now Megan Vass's mum doesn't want to meet with Colin. So that was really a low point. Let's make the objective Megan Vass or anybody around her. We just need to find somebody who saw Megan Vass on the foreshore, near the foreshore, on a dinghy, on the four winds, at the rowing club, somebody somewhere seeing something. That was our mission. He was very familiar with teenagers from the streets around that immediate area, and he saw them a lot. We kept going back to a man by the name of Stephen Gleeson. Stephen Gleeson, he was parked for many, many months on the car park of the Sandy Bay Rowing Club. He was sleeping rough in that Ford sedan for about nine months. He had a perfect front stall view of the four winds and the yachts around it. He, to me, offered the potential of being a really good witness to talk to, but of course, I found out he was an inmate in a prison. So I wrote to him, and we met and spoke for the next eight or nine months. Each time I saw him, I got more and more out of him and eventually he came to trust me, I think. And allegedly, on that Australia Day night, he remembers that he went to sleep around about 10 to 11 p.m. And as he was just nodding off, he was woken up by a young girl and a young guy. He knew them as homeless. He'd seen them before. He had some sausages there and he had a little gas cooker. So he fired it up and they all had a sausage each and a drink. And he said that this young girl and young guy said that they were then going to move on and go and do some stealing on the yachts. Colin wanted to see if Stephen Gleeson could perhaps identify whether that was Megan Vass. It's eight years later, so I'm not sure what Stephen Gleeson will actually remember. There are two sorts of visits that you can do at prison. One is a regular visit where you take no pens, no papers, you have nothing. And then there's a professional visit. 
which can be conducted by a lawyer. Jeff Thompson volunteered as a pro bono lawyer so that they would be able to have documents and show Stephen Gleeson a photo lineup to see if he could recognise anyone as the girl he saw on Australia Day night. This is really challenging because I'm in the prison car park and really it's not a place to have cameras. I'm just waiting for Colin and the lawyer to come out. They should have been out by now. I'm really concerned that our witness, Gleeson, has been scared off by police visiting him, by somebody in the prison making him feel rattled. Oh, here they come. Colin likes to have a poker face, but I could see it written all over him. He was as smug as anything. I showed Stephen Gleeson a photo folder of eight girls of similar appearance and similar age, and I just said, is any of those girls there resemble the girl that you talk about who woke you up and chatted with you? And he picked number three, Megan Vass. The identification of Megan Vass on that photo folder by Stephen Gleeson as being on the bay at that particular location that night, off to steal from yachts, was a massive breakthrough. This is the most significant thing of all. Yeah. Bar Megan saying she was there. This is a huge day. It's interesting, Stephen Gleeson said that Detectives had turned up and interviewed him and said, what are you talking about with this guy, Colin McLaren? And he explained that it was about Sue Neil Fraser. And he said to me that he was warned by these detectives to stop talking and not to say anything else or else he might find himself charged with something. I was able to get to the prison records for the visits of Stephen Gleeson. Apart from my own name, there were detectives that visited him. I've never seen this before, ever, with a witness. It's a dirty game, cops and robbers. There's no doubt about it. When you start delving into the possibility of a wrongful incarceration or miscarriage of justice, you're really challenging the elite detectives of any police department, and therefore you're up against reputations and legacies. And watch out. Seven plus. Stream big. We were convinced that Megan Vass, whose DNA was on Bob and Sue's yacht, was the linchpin to the whole case. Everything was about lining up a meeting with Megan. We were so desperate to talk to Megan. No one knew where Megan lived. She was just this enigmatic figure, this mirage almost of a person. And then a gem falls in our laps. Colin has discovered that Megan Vass has connections to local motorcycle gang, the Devil's Henchmen. After weeks of Colin negotiating with gang insiders, Megan has agreed to meet him face to face at a Hobart hotel. The big step is to get her into the room first of all. Then of course you get whatever you can. It's like going fishing. You might want to go for snapper, but you only finish up with bream. As long as you throw the rod in and catch something, you might catch a comment on, on videotape. You might get a statement. Um, any number of things could happen. You might get nothing. It's ringing. Rang out. Got to remember what world she's in. She might be in the middle of some skullduggery. We were constantly waiting for Megan to come. 
or for somebody to come that was bringing Megan. Yeah. It's a message from the go-between. Talk shortly, I'll bring her to you. Slowly, slowly, catch the monkey. Megan Vass wasn't arriving. She was supposed to be coming at a certain time. And she'd break that time, and then another time, and then another time. And we wait. Megan's a hard one. I mean, you don't come across too many Megans in your life. So all you can do in this situation is wait. You've got to develop the, the patience of a spider and just sit and wait. Megan's got a lot to be scared of. Imagine if she's seen two males kill Bob Chappell and she then divulges what she saw. She's at risk from them and any of their associates. There's a lot to be fearful. hear this picking noise on the adjoining door and I thought what the hell's going on here? Hello? Straight away, what went into my mind is the stuff I used to do years ago when I was a detective. We'd do a co what's called a covert entry. We'd sneak into a room when you think it's quiet and you think the people, are, they're not in their room. You know, see what they're doing, what sort of equipment they've got, what they're up to. I've got no doubt I disturbed a covert entry. We thought we'd rig something up to try and catch them. We thought they might be persistent and think we're stupid and come back. Colin sets a trap for anyone trying to break into the room. He pushes a table up against the adjoining door and sets up a motion sensor camera concealed in an AC adapter. We then went downstairs to reception and told reception and made a very big noise that we're going to go out for dinner and told everybody we, that would listen that we're going out for dinner, we're going out for dinner. And then off we went. The three of us went to a restaurant about half a kilometre away. So I just got a phone call from the hotel and they've said that there was marijuana smoked in one of the rooms. This is so fucked, I can't believe it. I absolutely freaked out because I thought we were going to have things planted in our room and that we were going to be charged. As soon as you walk into the bathroom, there's a heavy smell. What smell? I I've got a really good sense of smell. I do not smell marijuana. Smells like a bathroom. OK, I've walked in and it's hit me like a wall. Housekeeping have done exactly the same thing and my manager's come up as well. To be accused of smoking marijuana with no evidence, it was shocking. That's one way to stop us meeting with Megan Vass and filming an interview, is get us on drug charges. documentary filmmakers here and for a number of days now we've asked that our rooms do not be entered okay but ever since there's been all sorts of attempts to get into these rooms and to question us why all Colin ever wanted to do 
was talk to Megan Vass and get the truth from her and get that locked down in a statement. But now, there were so many weird things happening. Gabby arrested as soon as she got back to Tasmania. Megan Vass's mum saying, no, I can't meet you. She's got a friend who's a cop. Stephen Gleeson gets visited by police. And now all these weird things happening in a hotel where we're accused of taking drugs is someone trying to stop us seeing Megan. Colin has set a trap in the hotel room to catch intruders. He discovers that someone has tried to break in while he and Eve were out. We've had this desk hard up against this door. We did that very deliberately because someone tried to get in this door. They said there were two locksmiths. If you look at the height of the table to the door, there is a little stain there. You can see how it matches up perfectly. I'd suggest someone's peeked in, closed the door, but of course they've left a telltale sign. The table's moved. The motion sensor camera has also been triggered. See that? Yeah. The light changes. Mm. There it is again. Yeah. It was able to show us that the adjoining door again was opened slightly and you could see the light coming from the adjoining room coming into our room. Someone had a peep in, obviously looked at our cameras, assessed what was there, then closed the door. Someone's got an interest in us. It was frightening. I thought we were going to be arrested. There's no doubt in my mind that the world of policing in Tasmania had become aware that there was a team trying desperately to get to Megan Vass. Our hotel had been compromised. There was nothing more we could do but check out. Colin keeps negotiating with his underworld contacts. Weeks later, he discovers that Megan Vass is in hiding at a motorcycle gang member's house. Well, I'll, see, I'll see you as close to three as I can. But she just wants to see me at her house first. I'll just need you to drive me there just as a backup. All right, just in case there's 12 bikes in there ready to kill me. Colin hopes a face-to-face -face visit may convince Megan to make a statement. Megan was associated with the Devil's Henchman Outlaw Motorcycle Gang. And this is the landscape we're in. We're in the underworld. It's a murky world to get involved in, but this could potentially solve the case. Where's the front door? Around, around the, the corner. corner? Yeah. As long as you're watching the front door, that's fine. Colin's been inside for about two hours. It was going to be just a quick 10 minute briefing and then off to the hotel to speak in front of our cameras, but uh, Megan uh, doesn't appear to be of a mind to do that at this moment. I'll just come out and let you know what's going on so you don't have to keep worrying or thinking bad, but it's been pretty tough. It's a process, but it's a lot harder than I thought. All right. All right. All right. You've got a shit job which just hit me, but all right. Well, you want me to stay close, though, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't know who's going to come in that door. All right. get together with Megan was really quite unnerving. There was a noticeable vibe about her and she's jumpy and nervous and twitchy and looking every which way. She was quite fearful of these people that were on the yacht. That was incredibly intense back then. Eve. How'd it go? She's very aggressive and very 
assertive and abusive and she'd scream and carry on. And OK. The anger in her is quite extreme. Then, then about an hour and a half into it, I got her in a, in a mood where she, she was actually relaxed. Right. She'll be here in half now. She's going to do an interview with me. She finally agreed to that. Really? Do you think she'll turn up tonight? I said, well, will you definitely do it? And she said, yes. Good luck, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. I hope she talks. She finally, finally came to the hotel. She may not talk because the fear could be so great that she cannot talk about it because to talk about it puts her own life in jeopardy. But if she tells the truth and says, yes, I was there and here's what happened, Sue could be walking free. Is she prepared to finally tell the truth after all these years? G'day. Megan, how are you? All good? Oh. Cool. 